Okay, we're live on YouTube also. And I see we have people coming in. Coming in quickly, we're up to over 200 people already. So for those of you joining, we'll give it just a couple of minutes for people to get their technology all connected so people can get here. What can we do in the meantime? Ooh, you can do owl <laughs> imitation to entertain everybody, Ruar. Ooh, that's the, the eagle owl of Norway. Ooh, ooh. Male or female? Ah, it's the male. Okay. So, ah, you, you know both sexes of the great horned owl, so that's yeah. good. Yeah. Now, there are many owls that are vocally active this time of the year. So, in spring, okay. we are really, yeah, we are really waiting for the coming spring because there are a lot of voles around in uh, southern Norway at this time, and we really hope there will be a lot of uh, nesting great gray owls. They are really a booming vo voice, so... Almost mystical. And we may get hawk owls because there are quite a lot of hawk owls seen all around, reported. I won't try to imitate those because then I'll strain my, I really strain my voice if I do that. Oh, somebody asking if you can imitate Rockefeller the owl. So I assume you heard of Rockefeller, the one that was in the Christmas tree, the saw wet owl? I think you should ask David about that because he knows that very well when he uh, appears next time. Oh, I but you can do it. I'm, I'm, if I remember it right, I think it is a short, <laughs> some whistling sound, but I may, be, I may be... Uh, I may be wrong, but it's something like that. Yeah, more of a, I got to get my whistle going. <laughs> yeah, it's faster. Okay, yeah. There you go. There you have it. Well, the, the, the relative, the boreal owl is much faster. Go. That's another one. That's one we are familiar with in Norway. Okay, we're up to 282 people. Okay. We'll give it just a few more minutes. Okay. Um, what other owls can you do? Well, we do have the, the um, Ural owl here. It's uh, not that far from the barred owl of North America. So, Woohoo! There you have the female warning. Then you should be watching because she may go for you <laughs> if you are close to the nest. And you have um, pygmy owls are whistling. And you have the, the lonely doll. It's very a deep booming, like. It's not a strong voice, so you have to be quite close to hear them. And there are some where I you need a flute if I should imitate the sound. Tony owls, which are common in Europe. The male there, I can't imitate that one. I, I need a flute, but the female goes. <coughs> and that's a noise that can scare a lot of people. We have somebody asking if this is going to be an eruption year. It probably depends on where you are in the world. And that depends on which species you are talking about. We definitely have an eruption of the hawk owls in southern Norway now. They may be breeding here next year and then. We'll see. We have had some eruptions during the late 
uh, the last uh, gold peak years. So they do appear quite regularly now. Oh, and the person is asking in Wisconsin. So oh, okay. probably... There I couldn't know. We'll find out. Yeah. You are closer to find that out, I think. Yeah. And somebody asked what an eruption year is. That is usually because there has been a good reproduction in one place and then the voles or the food is diminishing and the owls start moving out to find other places to survive or to nest the next year. And then you get an eruption. And that fluctuates from one eruption year, year to the next. But if there has been a really successful nesting year, you will have a lot of birds taking part in an eruption, as we've seen for quite a few years in North America, <laughs> snowy owl. Okay, and one person wants to hear a boobo boobo again, the Eurasian eagle owl. Ooh. Ooh. Females are more like and a lot of other sounds. <laughs> Did you see what that <laughs> that ends up with? I'm coughing. Okay, I think we probably should get started. Over 300 people, but you have a lot to talk about, and I have a long introduction. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, just a little bit about the International Owl Center, if you're not familiar with this already. We are located in the little bitty town of Houston, Minnesota, less than a thousand people way down in the southeastern toe of the state. Um, and our mission is to make the world a better place for owls through education and research. So education is primarily what we do and a little bit of research on the side. Um, one of our big events and actually how the Owl Center started was our International Festival of Owls that we do the first weekend in March every year. Ruar has been to our festival at least twice. twice? Okay, it's been to Houston several times. I can't remember which is for owl festivals or not. And during the festival, we present the World Owl Hall of Fame Awards. So I've gotten to know all these amazing owl people around the world over the years. Well, as you all know, the state of the world is um, kind of in a wonky place right now. Our center needs to be closed. And something I've wanted to do for a very long time is to put together a speaker series like this because there's so many people in this world that are passionate about owls and know amazing things and are willing to share their information. So this seemed like the perfect time to do it because the world needs something good right now. So we've set this up so it's free. Um, we're trying to have them be sponsored and we're very thankful for all of you who have made donations to help this series um, because obviously the technology and the staff time to do this behind the scenes winds up being quite a bit and we're just trying to stay afloat and our, we're very thankful for our speakers doing this also. Um, this particular one was sponsored. This is our very first one that we're doing. And um, I did a Facebook fundraiser for my birthday um, for the first two presentations. So the people who contributed that to that to help sponsor this one are Karen Ryan, Carl and Marilyn Silling, Rachel Hellyer, Dale and Sue Scobie, Sherry McCullough, Carol Hansen, and Julie Bromrick. So thank you all for helping to make this possible and everybody else here who donated who's going to help keep this series going. Uh, you may also want to check out our website, which is internationalowlcenter.org. Nice long website. There's all kinds of information on there, but if you look on the menu, there's a section on owl conferences. That will give you information about past owl conferences, including proceedings from the past conferences. It will give you information about our next World Owl Conference, which we tentatively have scheduled for La Crosse, Wisconsin. It was gonna be the fall of 2021. We're pushing that back to 2022. And there's also a section on an e-newsletter where you can sign up to get our owl conservation and research e-newsletter. This goes out whenever we happen to have time um, and highlights owl research and conservation measures that have happened in the last year. So it kind of helps keep you up to date on what's going on in the world of owls around the world. Um, so definitely check that out. We will be recording this session. So 
Those of you who are participants probably are not going to show up. The only way you would show up in a recording is if we enabled your video and audio so that you could talk. Otherwise, you can type questions and um, that's not going to be an issue. And thank you for your patience with our technology. We've done Zoom meetings many, many times, but this is our first time doing a webinar, which is slightly different. Um, so we had some issues with registration and migrating things back and forth. Found out the hard way that Zoom, although they limit us to 500 participants, I can't cap the number of participants, which seems like a basic feature. So we had to move it back. Um, so thanks for your patience with that. You're here to talk to or hear from Ruar Solheim from Norway. Ruar is a very fun, entertaining presenter. I know you're gonna enjoy this. He's been studying owls for over 50 years, which makes him an old owl guy. <laughs> We're gonna meet a lot of these people over the, over the next several weeks. He is the senior curator of zoology at Ogder University's Natural History Museum in Norway. He has studied pygmy owls, boreal owls, ural owls, tawny owls, and um, also snowy and great gray owls, which are what he did his PhD on, which he completed this year. So he is officially Dr. Ruar Solheim now. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ruar. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, welcome to all of you. I should from my place for, say uh, good afternoon. But since you may be in a different part of the world, it may be more uh, correct to say good morning or even good night to some of you. I don't know. So maybe I should switch until, until the, the snowy owl version and just say woo, woo to all of you. Well, I've been lucky to be able to study the owls for, as Carla said, more than 50 years. So that is really, uh, a fascinating and very good life I've had. And uh, I would like to show you some uh, slides. I use PowerPoint, so then I have to share the screen with you. Let's see. And here we go with the snowy owl. Uh, I work at a museum situated in southern Norway called Agder Natural History Museum. We are part of a university for the last three years. And this is a very interesting workplace. I've been here for 25 years. And it is an, a mixture of dealing with dead birds and animals since we do collections. We don't kill animals. We take care of whatever we find dead. And of course, study the live birds and mammals. And that's the important thing. Well, I've been studying owls for many years. As you can see here, I've been lucky to be able to get in close contact with a lot of the species, which is uh, really fortunate. And you learn a lot. And of course, it's, uh, it gives you a lot of delightful uh, experiences and adventures. And of course, the most enigmatic of them all is the snowy owl. And I've also been very lucky to be able to see that at close range for many years. You all may be familiar with a story about Harry Potter. You may have read the books or you may have seen the films. And then you may be aware of that his closest companion is a snowy owl called Hedwig. And sadly, in the last book or the last chapter, Hedwig perishes. She dies. She's killed. So that is the story about the Hedwig. The other inter interesting thing is the owls that play Hedwig in the film are not females, they are males. But this then is the story of another Hedwig, but this is the Hedwig who lived. Well, a little bit about the snowy owl. Here's uh, Google Earth. Google Earth, Earth is very nice because you can turn the globe around in any direction and get a photo. This is where I'm situated right now. Here is the owl center. And this is the breeding distribution approximately of snowy owls. You see, they are situated in the Arctic tundra regions in the high north. Say, so, Bruar, I'm going to quickly. Some of us are getting a gray bar across the screen. OK, is it this down here or what is it going on? It, it is right above where it, on this slide. Oh, now it has gone away. Okay, yeah, the, uh, then it was this um, 
uh, information bar that came down on my screen. Okay. Oh, well, luckily, I ho hope it is gone now. Okay, and there's one up on top also. Yeah, I, I can't the right. get rid of this, I think. It's the information, uh, uh, it's the control center. I don't know how, what I, if I can click anything, maybe it will just disappear all completely. I'm not sure how to do that. Is it your video control or? No, no. Yeah, it's a control where you mute, stop video and share, etc. It's weird. I can dock the bottom or I can, This does this uh, change the, the, the bar you are talking about? Now it is in the bottom. Yeah, yes. now it's on the bottom. And now like a pop-up box came up off that bottom bar. Okay, this is weird. I, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about this. What are the, the bars are for controlling your video or? In no, it's, it's, the, the, it's the sharing or stop share screen bar. And also the one where you have the information with where if I can mute myself or uh, stop video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so can you stop sharing and when you go um, when you oh. go back in, when you share, just share your PowerPoint part and not your desktop. Yeah, I can share, it says share screen. Yep, but within share screen, you should be able to pick just uh, your PowerPoint presentation wow. instead of your whole screen. And then make sure you have share computer sound checked. Okay, where is this? Uh, no, now it is. Advance Power PowerPoint as virtual yep. background. Share PowerPoint screen. Uh, <laughs> what do you get now? Local. No, this is weird. Okay. Then we have really to go down here. Uh, sorry for all this trouble. We are not that familiar with the things. Neither of us, I think. Yeah, it was working before when we tested. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know why. Preparing PowerPoint, it says now. What do you get now? Now we have your snowy owl first slide. Yeah, and nothing more? Nothing more. Okay, let's see then if I can. Uh, is, now I don't get my... <laughs> Now I do not get my, yeah, yeah, well, here it is. Where is it? I don't see my pointer here. <laughs> this is kind of weird. I don't see my pointer on the slide, so I can't. Oh, no. It is actually counting all the slides, I think, to be possible, uh, make it possible to show them. Ah. Uh, this is strange. It really takes a lot of, of uh, time to record, to uh, prepare it. Oh, so it's just loading your presentation? Yeah, it's loading. It's loading the whole publication. Okay. Can okay. you? Okay, it's, it's uh, soon, uh, it, is, it is soon finished. Can you use your up and down arrows to move your slides? Not, not before it is finished. Okay. All the slides are there. Kind of weird. Okay, it is almost ready now. Yeah, now it's good. Uh, Can you use a mouse click? No, I, I. The problem is I, uh, I can't see my pointer on the screen, so I can't place it in a place. I, I get it down here, but this was not a good idea. <laughs> this was really not a good idea. Okay. If you hit escape, does that help? Uh, now I, I'm on this fair screen again. I think this is not good. Uh, 
basic. Let's go back to this one. I think you have to stop share and then reshare again. Okay, we can do that. Share, and I think I will go back to the PowerPoint there because that the, the, the first version there was not a good idea. Okay, how does it look now? We have the gray bars again. That's weird. Does it change now when I drag this along the... I can see your pointer, but the gray bars stay there. Still there? Uh, the bottom one went away. Yeah. Are there any other bars there now? Um, on the right side. Oh yeah, this is now. Now it went away. Okay, let's let, let us let us put it that, like that. I don't see anything now. So, but but anyway, well, snowy owl here distribution. Uh, let's see if it, uh, this. Uh, now what is this? This is kind of. Yeah, here it comes. It has also bred, the snowy owl ha has also bred on Iceland and some years back, even on Shetland. It used to breed in the southernmost part of Norway in the mountain plateau called Hardangevida, but here they disappeared after 1974. So now we have concentrated our work to the northernmost part of Scandinavia, mostly Norway, but also Sweden and Finland. And we have also been able to work in the prairies in Canada, Saskatchewan and Alberta, and more of that later. Well, this is an old uh, photo from uh, the Hardanger Plateau in Norway, one of the most nice photos I know of a snow owl family in black and white from 1963. This is uh, how it looks like. I've been up there for the last four years and checking up the old uh, uh, nesting uh, areas to see if they are still intact, and they are, but there are no owls there. So we are wondering if they one day will come back. But the questions about the snowy owls are, where are they when they do not appear on the breeding grounds? And how many snowy owls are there? Or to put it in another way, what is the world population of snowy owls? This is what I started pondering about. Uh, about when I uh, took uh, interest in the snowy owls many years back, and especially when watching them disappear from the Hardanger Plateau. In 1999, the first snowy owls in the world got satellite transmitters, and it was Denver Holt and colleagues that put transmitters on a few owls in Barrow, in the northernmost part of Alaska. And these results really uh, said that it was uh, possible now to put transmitters on snowy owls. And I was really eager to try to do that in Norway. So we applied for funding, but didn't get anything. Uh, these are the very interesting results. Two females in autumn, they crossed the Bering Strait. They went into Russia. One went down to Kamchatka. And in spring, she crossed Russia up to the Arctic coast and went even further west. And then the next year, in 2001, they were back, not even in Alaska, but into Canada, to Victoria Island, where they probably nested. So nested here one year, probably not nesting in Russia, and then back and nested here. So it really showed that the snowy owls are long distance flyers. So I thought up a different way of uh, approaching a question about the snowy owls. Are the snowy owls around, around the whole Arctic one population or are they mixed in, uh, divided in several subpopulations? So I thought there are so many snowy owl skins in the museums. In the, the Nordic countries, countries, there are more than 400. So I thought maybe we could use the skins to derive DNA material and check out the DNA to see if they are divided in subpopulations. So I initiated the project and this uh, lady, uh, uh, Gunil Martins Martinson, she did this as part of her PhD some years back. This is Lee Wendeberg who also took part. And we got material from Scandinavia, from Canada and from the eastern part of Russia. And to just be very short because I'm not that into DNA techniques, but if these owls had been 
divided in subpopulations, not linked at all. We would have had the, the blue indicated genetic markers down here, maybe the green here and the red here. But this tree shows that it was all mixed up. So they shared genetic material all around the whole Arctic. So it indicated that the owls were really moving about. But the question then, would they move, for instance, from Europe over to North America or the other way? At least we knew that they were crossing the Bering Strait. So the question was, how far do they move? Uh, in 2005, uh, based on, on this article, I was approached by the Norwegian Broadcasting and we made a film on snowy owls and we were able to go to Barrow and visit Denver Hall, one of the great snowy owl uh, scientists uh, in Northern America. So I was lucky to, for the first time in my life, to see a snowy owl nest. And here we stand watching over the tundra. It looks like real wilderness, but look how it looks like when we went to the other side of the nest. It's just one kilometer away from the city dump. So here in Barrow, the snowy owls are really nesting close to the city. In 2005, we also started a new snowy owl project in Norway. <clears throat> and we were four guys, it's me, and there are two guys, uh, Thomas and Ingar, working for the Norwegian Ornithological Society or BirdLife Norway. And Carlotta Jakobsen here, he works at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research in Northern Norway. So we are spread all over. Those two work in the central Norway. I'm in the south, south, and he's in the north. And in 2007, we managed to capture our first snowy owl and equip her with a satellite transmitter. And we named her Albertine. <clears throat> well, how and when can you find snowy owls? You really have to look for these guys. This is a Norwegian lemming, a very aggressive animal almost jumping up, trying to say, I will kill you. It's a very nice little animal, but they are really aggressive. And snowy owls, they nest when there are a lot of voles around, the, the lemmings and also voles. This is the root vole, they are grass eaters. And for those of you who are not familiar with these small mammals, the interesting part is that they are fluctuating in numbers. These are curves by other scientists checking for two locations in Northern Norway. And as you can see, uh, these are lemmings, the, the triangles, these are voles. Uh, one year there may be many, then they uh, decline. And then three or four years later, they increase again. And you can also note that in a period from the late eighties up to the mid two thousands, they almost didn't peak. They were, they were there, but there were no big peaks. And then they started peaking again, 2007, 2011, 2015. And these three years, we had snowy owls nesting in Northern Norway. And we were able to do field work and band snowy owls and equip them with satellite transmitters. Well, to find the snowy owl, you may go out in the misty mountains, appearing like a scene from Lord of the Rings, perhaps. You all know about Gandalf uh, camouflage, maybe. And there may be also some uh, serious water skiing in spring because there's a lot of melt water. So this is hard time if you do it that way. But luckily, yeah, and well, sometimes you may be lucky to even see a snowy owl, but they are far between and you may walk for very many days and long distances. And sometimes you even have to bring a snowy owl yourself. But luckily in Norway, we have had good contact with the nature management authorities and we have got funding. So we have been able to use helicopters and they are really fantastic machines. They don't leave tracks in the terrain. They can just come in, lift you in and place you at the um, a campsite and go out again. And we use helicopters to find, find the snowy owls. Usually, if there are a lot of voles and there, seem, there, there are indications of snowy owls going to breed, they are observed in late winter, early spring. And we get then reports from uh, mountain rangers, from uh, the reindeer people, and from tourists if they see snowy owls. 
And when we get reports, we plot them, and then we know where to look for them later in uh, late June. And then we appear with helicopter. Here is Carlotto sitting with a computer and following uh, the track, the GPS track of the helicopter and guiding the pilot where to fly so we can look for the snowy owl. And this is how it looks like when we, no, sorry, when we go about. This is Lake Dugan in the mountain area uh, of Sweden and Norway, the borderline between Lots of snow, but also no green patches. And usually the snowy owl sit on the snow patches. Of course, it's not a white bird on a white surface. But when they take off and they do and they have a couple of pounds, then we are able to see the owl. And of course, we can't fly in bad weather. We can only fly when it's certain time and good light conditions. So then we are able to cover all the mountains Here we come into an area with the really prime habitat of snowy owls. These mounds, the esters, are where the snowy owls place the net. So here we are really going back and forth and searching very slow. And of course, if we are lucky, we find this. This is a snowy owl uh, sitting on her eggs. Here also there is a nest. The snowy owl female is off. We take photos and you because now in the age of digital photography we can immediately uh, increase the size of the image and see that there are eggs. One, two, three, four, five, six and two chicks. And then we know the exact date where we have to go back to ban chicks and check uh, and probably capture adult owls. In 2011, we had a very nice experience. We had uh, three owls from 2007 that got transmitters, but all transmitters had stopped working. One male sent his last signals in April, and then he was back at the nesting grounds in Norway. Uh, and when we flew with the helicopter, we took photos of some flying owls, and lo and behold, one of them had a transmitter on his back. So this is actually our old male. In 2011, when we were flying, we saw a place, we checked the place where we had got information of a pair of snowy owls uh, seen by tourists in early May. So we went there and we saw this male uh, sitting on the mound, but we couldn't see any nest. We went back and searched two days later and the male was still there, but we didn't see anything. So we landed and started searching the terrain. And the male really indicated that he did not like us being around. He was warning, giving the warning calls. So he definitely should have a nest and a female. And we searched and searched, and then eventually we found the nest close to this lake. And it was a sad sight because there were seven dead chicks or five dead chicks, two were barely, barely alive, and there were three unhatched eggs and a lot of lemmings. So something must have happened to the female, we thought. The two, the two smallest chicks were still barely alive, so I put them inside my shirt toward my stomach to try to warm them up. And then we uh, went to search for the female. And suddenly she flushed from just a few meters away from the nest and took off over the water. And I could clearly see that she was really bloody underneath and thought she must be hurt. Maybe she had been attacked by another raptor or something. And then suddenly she just landed in the water and, and, and went down. So we rushed back to the helicopter and took off and landed at the other side of the lake. And that took 15 minutes. And when we were there, that's what we found. The snowy owl female had drifted to the shore and she really looked really bad. Uh, I went down and picked her up and she really looked like a carcass, a dead owl. Took her up and immediately started to check her up to see what could have befallen her. And we could not find any signs of her being attacked by a raptor like a deer falcon or a golden eagle or something. She was 
fine, but, but with a lot of blood. What we did find, however, was that her eyes were really clotted up with blood. And this was caused by uh, black fly attacks, very heavy blood sucking in, uh, insect attacks. So she could almost not see. So she had really abandoned her chicks because she, she was not able to see. She couldn't tend to herself. But her heart was still beating. So I thought, well, we have to try to save her. Um, some of the other guys were a little skeptic. They said, no, she's a goner. But said, no, we take her back to the civilization and see what we can do. So we got back and I got a hair dryer and started blowing warm hair towards her and got some water and uh, cotton swabs and started to try to get some of the blood away. Here's what it looked like. Her skin was really bluish greenish because um, caused by all these uh, black fly bites. It looked really horrible. And her eyes were clotted up, but with water, it was able to, to uh, soften all this clogged blood and get it away. So eventually he was, she was able to open her eyes and look around. And after two hours, she started sitting up. So I thought, hmm, this is going our way. Maybe we will be able to save this owl. And she was given some uh, teaspoons with water and sugar to, to get in a little better shape. And then we put her in a cage for the night. And then in the morning, she looked really good. Just amazing that we were able to get her in this state. So we started, we gave her lemmings, but she wouldn't feed. So we had to force feed her and thought maybe we will have to keep her here for uh, a whole week. But after two days, she was so eager to get out that we thought we can't, we can't keep her here. She's in a good enough shape that we can let her loose. Uh, sadly, the last two chicks also died. They were too cooled down, so we were not able to revive those. So all her uh, chicks and the eggs uh, perished, but she survived at least. So we took her out and we decided that we would name her after Harry Potter's famous owl, Hedwig, in honor of that owl. And we gave her a satellite transmitter. You can see here, she is really struggling and saying, keep off, don't do this, I don't like this. And then, she is ready to go. Uh, we didn't have the helicopter longer, so we had to bring her as close to the nest as possible and we let her go. And here she takes off. This is Hedwig on the wing, flying again. I'm quite sure she went back to the nest place, checking out and finding that uh, her nest was empty. And then she took off further north in Norway. But this wasn't the only owl that was uh, subject to black fly attack this summer. This is another owl in Finland. So here is what we got from Hedwig. In autumn, she was along the coast in Norway. In December, she was on Kola Peninsula. In early April, she was further east. And then eight days later, she was on Cap Kanin. Eight days later, she was there. And further eight days later in May, she was on the island Vaigat. And then she ended up in the middle of uh, the Taimur Peninsula and stayed there until August. And earlier we had only had one, the male that I showed you, he had been this far east. So she really made a new record. In 2007, we put transmitters on three owls. And this is what they showed us. They, when they were finished nesting in Northern Norway, they flew eastwards into Russia and the next year, all the way to uh, Novaya Zemlya or to Vaigats or even to Paimu Peninsula. And they go back and forth and in winter they often ended up here on Kola Peninsula. So in 2011 we had more snowy owls nesting and we were able also to follow some of them from camouflage tents. Here the male comes in, it's always the male doing all the hunting, bringing in lemmings, presenting to the female and she usually accepts it. And then she starts uh, parting the, um, the carcasses into smaller pieces to feed the chicks. Here we get some guts. I don't know if that is good, but that's what we get. And then there's a little family time altogether.
Uh, here's something strange. Uh, there's the uh, air, dirt flying in the air. What is happening? The female is actually doing homework cleanup. She uses her beak and as a shovel and pushes away and throws away a lot of dirt from the nest scrape. And that's why the female snowy owls really look like dirt in the face during the nesting period. They do a lot of cleaning. In 2011, we put transmitters on nine females and three males. And they did the same as the former three owls. They went to Russia, to Novaya Zemla, Vygots, and far off into Taimir, back and forth, back and forth. This is very special because in winter, uh, 2012 to 13, uh, there was one female that appeared. She flew back to Norway in November and then she started going southwards. And when she came down here in mid Norway, uh, the signals indicated that uh, she was either dead or the transmitter had fallen off. So, because the transmitter was still active, Inga and uh, another uh, mountaineer were able to locate the carcass. And here she is. This owl was called Marna. That was the first we abandoned in 2011. And she was uh, in a good shape. So she was uh, taken, the carcass was taken to Trondheim to check thoroughly for what could have happened. Here she's going in for an MR scan. Really a nice technique. And uh, she may have been, uh, she had definitely starved. And she may have had some uh, infection. We don't, don't actually know. Uh, but this gave the, gives the opportunity to study how the molt of the birds progress. And I've taken a lot of interest in feathers and molt. This is the wing of the live bird in 2011, summer, before she started molting. This is in 2013, after two molts. And that gives the opportunity to compare each feather and see are these new or is it the old ones left? And I've tried to figure out which year each feather was grown. And these three feathers seem to be the same one, not molted. The other ones have been changed. It's not so easy to see on the secondaries here, but the primary hand feathers here, you can follow. In 2015, we had another Curious, uh, very exciting incident because in Sweden there was a snowy owl appearing at a nest site with a transmitter on her back. And by then, all our transmitters from 2011 had stopped working, batteries were out. So then came the question which individual was this? Because it had to be one of our, our owls. We had nine female candidates, but we knew that three of those were dead. So we were down to six. And then I started comparing which new feather in the wings here could uh, appear as an old and molted feather here and did the pattern of the bars and spots match. And doing that revealed that this one was the best candidate. We also, we can see that these two feathers seem to be the same feather, not molted. At least the patterns were quite similar. We also had the left wing of the owl, so we could do that as well. And there was one feather that seemed to be the same. And we did have blood samples from the owl from uh, 2011. And we had molt feathers from the nest in 2015. Uh, sadly, we were not able to capture that bird because the nest uh, failed. But comparing DNA from the blood and from the feathers, we could conclude that it was the same individual. I've taken a great interest in studying feathers, molt and detail. So now I'm going to, to uh, scoop a little bit down into some detail here. This is David Johnson helping me with the studying of snowy owl skins at the Smithsonian in Washington. And this is what it looks like. These skins are not so easy to study because the wings are folded in. But you can see this feather sticks out from these. These are juvenile feathers and this is an adult feather. These birds use more than one year to change all the feathers in the wing. And you can see a difference between juvenile and adult feathers. Even the coverts up here appear different. This is an adult covert. These 
are juveniles, more irregular spots. These are more uh, nice bands. So I made mold schemes like this. Go just quickly through it. They start molting feathers in the inner part of the wing, and then maybe one or two in the outermost part, in the hand here. And then more feathers next year, and the third year, they start molting some of the innermost primaries here. Uh, because these the wings I studied were folded, it was not possible to study the secondary. That we've been able to do later. Here is a completely juvenile bird, and there is a lot of smudge in these um, coverts up here. This bird uh, is a female, and it's possible to see that these feathers stand out compared to the other primaries. And these are actually adult primaries, while these are juveniles. The outer bands are thinner, and there is a shorter distance between the bands than in these feathers. The, the feathers are also more pointed than these ones. And also in the secondaries, you can see the difference. These feathers with red are the new adult ones, while these are juvenile feathers. They are more worn, they are more bleached, and there are four or five bars visible on the outer vein of the feather. On these feathers, there is only three bars visible. So this makes it possible to use flight images like this and pick out the adult feathers standing out towards the juvenile feathers. And then you can actually age the bird. Snowy owls appear every now and then in big eruptions. And this is from North America in 2000, autumn 2011. And there were huge numbers of snowy owls turning up all around. These are images I got from a, a guy in uh, Canada. This from Van Vancouver Island. And on this image, within this circle, there is actually 18 different individual snowy owls. That's amazing. That's a huge congregation of owls. And Seeing snowy owls in heaps like this is really rare, but they are all juvenile birds. There are no adult, no adult birds here. Why they turn up in this dense numbers, I don't know. Maybe there are a lot of uh, things to eat here. I'm not sure. In 2015, you see here Norway, Kola Peninsula, Novaya Zemlya, and this little island is called Belii. There is a Russian guy who is at the research institute in Salakhard down here. He's called Alexander Sokolov uh, and is part of the, the Snowy Owl group. He did uh, field work there, uh, registering a lot of snowy owls appearing in July. So he approached me to go through all the images he took there. This is where he did his survey closer and he did GPS tracks for several days and he went uh, almost 70 kilometers on the tundra and he took a lot of uh, photos and most of the owls he saw was in this region here. And from one point one day he could actually see 89 snowy owls. That's amazing sitting on the tundra. He presented a lot of images each day all in all, 344 images. And this is how each image looked like from his raw data. So then I go through, I enlarge the images, and then I start checking out the wing feathers. And I can see that this bird has actually molted two primary feathers on this wing and one here. This is a juvenile bird in its first molt. Uh, shortly after he photographed that bird, this is also a juvenile bird, I can see from the feather here. Then the question arrives, is this the same individual? I can align the wings and I start comparing each feather. And if you look at the bars here, they're almost aligned, the bar on the inner vein and the outer vein. Here they are quite different. The inner vein bar hits between those two spots on the outer vein. On that wing is the same. This um, that feather, that bar hits between two spots, but on this wing it is completely aligned. This is enough to tell that these owls are two different individuals. Here is a male 
uh, and for each uh, photo, you, you get data with the digital uh, cameras and you get a, um, a date and a time of day when the image was taken. So I arranged all the images and the time and what it was. But then it was a bit strange. There was something wrong with the timing here. And I found out because there was one given spot where um, Alexander saw a uh, had a snowy owl nest. And then I was able to plot that nest along the GPS route because the GPS also gives time for each point uh, along the route. So then I could correct the time. The camera turned out to be four uh, hours uh, ahead. So then correcting the time, it was actually possible to uh, plot down where each interesting image was taken along along the routes, and that showed that the images were taken where uh, Alexander told that he had seen most of the owls. Here's what it looked like. You can see. Imagine you go along the tundra. Here you see five snowy owls. There are one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Very nice. When you can see this amount of owls. Here's an interesting example. This is an owl photographed uh, at uh, 1313. This is photographed 25 minutes later. And plotting these along the route, I can see that what, the first image was there, and the next was there, 240 meters apart. Question arrives, was this the same or two different males? They look quite similar and uh, enlarging the images. It really seems to be the same individual. These spots here isn't the same. Uh, looks really similar. But luckily, he also had uh, photos of the bird in both instances taken to the wing. And then when I compare the different spots on the wings, I clearly see that this is the same individual. Uh, it's also possible to see that this bird has molted the longest primer here. That's number seven. We count 10, 9, 8, 7. And that's typical of a bird in its first molt. So, the, And these are juvenile. So this bird was clearly in its second calendar year. It was hatched in 2014. This female has a different pattern in the wing. This outermost primary is juvenile. That has been molted. These two are adult. This is growing uh, an adult feather. And these here seem to be juvenile. The first one is diff difficult. So this bird has molted two or maybe three times. It may be in its third molt. So it's in its third to fourth calendar year. So by plotting the different uh, sexes, and ages along the tundra, I end up with a minimum of 25 individuals, which I can both sex to male, females, and to age. These are the really old ones. So what we found was that 14 out of 25 owls were first year birds. That is hatched in 2014. 20 of the 25 owls were between two, three, one and three years in its second to fourth calendar year. That is 80%. Only 20% of the birds were really old owls. That is hatched in 2011 or earlier. We know that in Scandinavia, there were snowy owl chicks produced in 2011 and in 2015. So snowy owls hatched in 2011 would be five CY in its fifth calendar year in 2015. So then the question arises, what was the origin of all the young birds, second calendar or third to fourth calendar year owls, which turned up on Billy Island in the summer of 2015? Well, this is the map of the birds we banded in 2011 in northern Scandinavia, and they were all over Russia in the Russian Arctic in 2012, 13, and 14. And this is the Belly Island. So this, linking these two different information sets together, we can say that all the young birds which turned up here in July 
2015 most probably have been hatched somewhere in this part of the Russian Arctic because there were no breeding in Scandinavia these years. Linking together all the information from the satellite birds in Norway, we found that in uh, early spring, most of the birds are either in Scandinavia or along the Russian coast. In June to August, red, we, when it's breeding time, they may be up to Nuaya Zemlya and also here on Primeu. September, they are moving a bit westward again. And the interesting part is in December to March. Then most of the birds stay in Kula Peninsula, sometimes in, in Scandinavia, but mostly on the Kola Peninsula. So it turns out that the Kola Peninsula is a very important winter area for the snowy owls in the northwestern part of Europe, Russia, Scandinavia. And why are they there? Probably because they find a lot of these birds, willow grouse and ptarmigan, which may turn up in huge numbers. And this is a snowy owl photographed in the light from a car by Alexander Sokolov, uh, which has recently taken a willow grouse. And sometimes these birds flock in really huge numbers. But they may also uh, apply other strategies. They may fly out into the ice and start hunting water birds. And this is from North America and one male that hunts black ducks. In 2007, we took an initiative to gather most of the people we could find out which worked with snowy owls around the globe. And we initiated an international snowy owl working group. And we have met uh, several times trying to pull together all the knowledge of the people who really work with snowy owls. And we had the first meeting agenda in Saskatoon in Canada, hosted by the late Gary Bartolotti who sadly passed away in 2011. And that was really uh, exciting to meet a lot of snowy owl geeks like us, ourselves who really took a huge interest in this owl. In 2014, we were in Russia, in Boston in 2017. And lately in uh, March, just uh, the week uh, when the Corona situation exploded, we were able to pull through the meeting in Northern Norway in Kosovo. Um, what happened here? Okay. So we met a lot of very experienced uh, and uh, nice guys. This is the Dan Sattelentrup and Martin Stoffel in Canada in Saskatchewan, which are expert uh, snowy owl capturers. There is a uh, Mike Blom in Alberta. This is from 2019 when we indicate that we have captured and put transmitters on four snowy owls. Huge success. And we have Tom McDonald in US, which is a, an expert uh, bander and really good at reading snowy owl psychology. Learned a lot from him. him. And we have Norman Smith in Boston, who has been working with snowy owls at Logan Airport capturing a lot of owls, trying to save them from the uh, big uh, jet engines and putting transmitters on a lot of birds. And last but not least, in 2013, in North America, there was initiated a project called Project Snowstorm, it's a crowdfunding project. And they have now raised more than 250,000 US dollars. It's just amazing, really impressive. And they've put transmitters on more than 90 snowy owls. The, the, they have provided a huge amount of new data on what these birds do. This is what our birds, we have uh, provided transmitters to these guys in Canada. They, the birds have got transmitters down here. And this is what these owls do. They go up to Victoria Island, to south of Baffin Island, and to the western part of Hudson Bay, where they nest. And then they come down to the plains again in winter. Uh, this is uh, a summing up of some of the uh, data which has been uh, gathered on snowy owls since the first snowies here in Barrow got transmitters in 1999. They moved back and forth here. Uh, there are owls here that go down into the interior of uh, Alaska and up again. 
uh, on Violet Island, uh, there are owls that have stayed up in the Arctic all winter. The birds from Boston go up into the uh, Baffin Island, Hudson Bay area with a nest going down again. Uh, and then birds from Scandinavia go to Russia and they go back again, back and forth. There is uh, one, some birds which have gone to northeast Greenland and southwards. So, and then we have the birds we have added in Alaska, which really, or in, in central Canada, I mean, which really go up north and south again. And there are recent results from northeast Greenland where birds linked up to Ellesmere Island. They move this along the northern part of Greenland. So what we really now need is information on snowy owls in the midsection of Russia. What do they do? The owls that nest here, do they fly south into Mongolia and winter as these owls do? Or do they just go back and forth along the Arctic coast? We don't know. And we should really like to know. So back to the question, how many snowy owls are there really? The former official world population was that it was approximately 300,000 birds. I started wondering that, that there must be something wrong about that. And that was after I visited Denver Holt in 2005. Uh, and he told me about uh, how many owls they had found in Alaska breeding. And then I thought, there must be something wrong. There can't be as many as 300,000 birds. And then on the genetic studies, uh, there was an estimation that there were, would be only be between 4,500 4, 4, to 14,000 breeding females. That gives up a population of uh, less than 30,000 adult birds. And that's the same as was concluded in the snowy owl monograph from 2012. Maximum of 14,000 pairs, uh, much less of the years with low food availability. So we concluded that the uh, snowy owl is probably critically endangered as a top predator in the Arctic. And we have been working to get IUCN to change the status of the snowy owl. And it is now not any longer a bird of least concern, but it has been moved up into the threatened category. And we think that climate change may seriously worsen this situation. Well, we could try to ask the snowy owl what she thinks. Not easy. Maybe she gets bored. Maybe she's looking forward to her six to be able to fly. We don't know. It's interesting to watch these birds when they can move their eggs and nest. So at least I really hope that the snowy owl may not meet a no through road if the Arctic is warming up as fast as we fear it may do in the current situation. It would be bad if the snowy owl would really disappear. There may be fewer snowy owls, but we really hope we will have them along in the future as well. And to add a slogan from the 70s that was uh, linked to a very famous drink, owls add life. I really mean that. So to conclude, thank you all for watching. Thank you very much, Ruar, for doing this, despite all our fun technical um, Joyce, I had some on the back end. Apparently, we had some issues with registrations. But we do have a whole lot of questions for you. Are you ready for questions? Yeah. Okay. One of the very popular questions is, how long do snowy owls live? So they're talking about on average, maximums. Well, uh, on average, it's hard to say because all birds of prey and owls have a you a high mortality during the first year so often very few birds live to be <clears throat> more than one year old 
But if they have survived this first year, then they may really live to be maybe up to 20 or 25 years old. We have small owls as small as the tawny owl that has reached uh, 24 years, banded birds. Uh, and we have eagle owls that reach that kind of age. So we re really think that, and we do have a recapture of snowy owls up to 20 years old, just one or a few. So I think they may be up to 20, 25 years, but not many experience that high age. And somebody specifically was wondering if you knew how old Hedwig was. Uh, not more that she was at least in her fifth calendar year or older because all her wing feathers were adult. So she had probably been hatched in 2007 or earlier. Okay, how many eggs are laid and how many survive? Uh, usually we can find uh, six to eight eggs. That is a, a good clutch in, uh, in a year of uh, many voles, high vole peaks. But uh, as you saw with uh, this um, Hedwig clutch, she had actually laid 10 eggs. So they can sometimes lay as many eggs as, as that. But I think it's rare that more than five or six chicks survive when there are many voles. Um, how do the black flies survive when it's that cold out there? Well, they survive as larvae in the water during winter. They are water linked. So they only emerge when they hatch in spring, when it's uh, thawing again. And then related to that, um, do the, are the black fly attacks a new occurrence on snowy owls? Is that something related to climate change? that we don't know. We have described it and there are other indications that black flies are increasing as a nuisance for a lot of tundra birds. But this pair were probably quite unlucky because they were a little lower in the terrain than most of the other birds. There were some birch brushes uh, close to the nest and they nested close to a stream. A, a water with a stream and that's where you find the black fly larvae. So maybe that gave the situation for getting a lot of black flies. Uh, but there are other incidents with also black flies pestering birds, but this is really the worst we have ever seen. Okay, we have a couple of people asking about if snowy owl feathers fluoresce under UV light like saw white owl feathers do. Uh, I don't think so. I think I have tested it, but I'm, I'm a little precaution. I'm not quite sure, but I do, do not think they do. But I'm not, I'm not sure. What, what was the main reason that you stopped um, the satellite transmitters? Battery drainage, mortality? No, it's the batteries that go out. We program the transmitters to last as long as possible. So the, the transmitters, they usually send signals for five hours, then they go into um, uh, <coughs> silence for eight days, and then they start up again. That is how you can prolong the duration, because what we really wanted to find out was how, how far do these owls move between different nesting seasons when there are many voles and maybe no voles at all and do they nest other places so that was the main issue of getting an answer to and we really have got good answers to that uh now i can't hear you do you want to end your screen sharing so that you go back to full screen with your just yourself yeah well how do i do that or i can do it I think you can must do it. There we go. Um, no. Our, wow. our, there we wow. go. Wow. Are you? Um, oh, what? <laughs> um, are you able to use um, owls like a fingerprint for birds? Uh, rephrase that again. Uh, are you? Are you able to use the feathers? The, the markers. Yes, that, that's yeah. what I've really been working on, to 
as long as a feather is unmolted, you could follow that feather for maybe two, three, maybe up to four years and compare the birds. See if uh, one image of a bird, one, you usually have flying birds then with outstretched wings. If, the, if you have two feathers which uh, are really different in, in patterns, it, it's enough with only one different pattern to say that this bird is a different bird from that one. But to say that it is the same bird, you will have to have more than one spot. You have several spots, maybe several feathers, but sometimes they are so distinct that you can say, this is the same bird. I've done this with Greek reals also. To follow them, we can even, even follow a, a, a bird that has moved several kilometers, not banded, not anything, but just by the photos of the feathers say that this is the same bird that two months, months ago was in that position. Okay, at what age do young snowy owls mate and do they mate with the same partner for life? Uh, they do not mate with the same partner. That is just accidental because they don't stay together during winter time. But I'm quite sure that they may remember each other as individuals. That may be possible. They, we have actually had at least three females which have nested as one-year-old birds. So they are able to mate when they are one year old, probably more often females than males, because I don't think that females will accept the young males. They want the old experienced males, but the males, they go for anything. That's familiar, isn't it? <laughs> um, what are the primary predators that cause snowy owl mortality? Um, not sure, but we think they may be taken by gear falcons, golden eagles, and they may be pested by sea eagles. Uh, and of course, on ground, there may be ground predators. I know from Wrangell Island, where Irina Manusina has been working, I think wolves or maybe wolverines could predate the nests. Usually in the Arctic, you have the Arctic fox, and that the owl is able to deal with. So I think it's more mostly the large uh, birds. And we know from Saskatchewan, for instance, if you have snowy owls sitting up on the pole and suddenly they stretch their heads and they really take off and one to two kilometers away, there comes a bald eagle. They don't like eagles at all. Um, will, how will the recent allowance of oil drilling in Alaska affect the owls? That is a bit difficult to me to know or tell. The, the, the link would be if it diminishes the amount of prey available for the owls. Because if you look at how they uh, nest uh, around Barrow, they nest quite close to settlements. So that isn't the big issue. It's more like if they have the prey, they can nest. Ooh, here's a good one. We have somebody watching from Mongolia and they sure. say, we do have some rare winter visiting snowy owls in Mongolia, nice. but every winter, perhaps due to eruptive movement. Do you know how many breeding pairs could poss possibly breed in central Siberia, specifically north of Mongolia? Uh, I do not know. I think there, then you have to go into uh, older Russian literature and maybe uh, expedition literature, but I haven't done that. But there may be some old uh, information uh, hidden in the written sources which could tell about that. Okay. Are lemming and vole populations showing declines uh, from pressures of climate change? Uh, that is also a question that is hard to answer because there there, there was concern uh, before the mid 2000s that lemming and some voles were really declining. And there were papers published in the international magazines uh, claiming that this is caused by climate change. And then suddenly after 2005, some of these small mammals started to appear again and really peak. So there were other articles coming, oh, it wasn't climate change at all. And th that is very typical. It is really hard to, to hardcore uh, claim that 
something happening is really caused by climate change. Uh, so so it, uh, it may be, of course, that what could happen is if when climate uh, changes the amount of drift ice and uh, the ice conditions in the high Arctic where some owls really go out along the coast or into the polynias hunting seabirds during winter, that could uh, influence them. But in what way? It is hard to predict. Okay, Jim Duncan's chiming in here from Manitoba, Canada. And he says, thanks for the presentation. He has observed ravens attacking and harassing snowy owls for 30 or more minutes and more frequently in winter in Southern Manitoba, Canada in recent years. Can ravens kill a snowy owl? Maybe they can, I don't know. But we have also seen that uh, in, in Saskatchewan and the guys there, they've seen ravens harassing the snowy owls and they don't like it. But I think snowy owls, if they are in a good condition, they would be able to outfly a raven, just like uh, shorted owls do if they are pested by crows. They just go higher and higher and higher and higher to, until one by one the crows fall off and go to the ground and then the owl is up there. So I think snow is maybe be able to avoid ravens. Okay, are there Russian organizations working with snowy owls and are you working with them? There are no organizations. There are individual uh, biologists and we do have contact with a few of those. So yes. Ooh, here's a fun one for you. Mm -hmm. uh, do nest mates, as in siblings, have similar feather markings? That I have not studied, and I couldn't tell for sure. But you could think so, because when you look at all the juvenile birds captured by these uh, expert banders in North America, and uh, I've got a lot of photos from, from these guys for the molt studies, you can see that there are really quite uh, marked individual differences. And then you could also uh, think that there might be differences uh, like some females in one clutch, maybe all, maybe more darker marked than females in another clutch. But that I've not been able to study and have, 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 I don't know at all. Okay. Um... Do the, uh, hang on, the questions are jumping around here. Uh, do the primary feathers get longer and secondary feathers get shorter as they molt into adult plumage, resulting in a change in wing shape? I think maybe uh, at least the secondaries may become a bit shorter, but that too is nothing that I, I have really um, uh, sorted out. Uh, but usually if you have a wing where you have adult and juvenile feathers, it's usually with the secondaries that you see that there is a difference, that juvenile feathers sometimes may be longer. You may, you may even see this in eagles as well. So, so there is something to it, but I can't tell if it is a, a general rule. Um, if an undergraduate was interested in getting into your field, what do you recommend they do to be successful? <laughs> Spend a lot of time out in the field. Always bring a notebook and note everything you see and experience. Read a lot of literature, what has been done in other places, and then see if there are anybody you can hook up with that do work on owls. Okay, here's a great one. What is the best way to tell the difference between a male and a female snowy owl? Uh, it is usually the, the plumage uh, and especially in the wings. But I got, I have a nice photo of two stuffed snowy owls in the office of Norman Smith at his museum. And they are so similar, it is really hard. I. I usually present these images for ornithologists and ask, can you tell the age and, and sex of these two? And nobody dare usually, and they're so similar because there is a, um, a, a quite a spotted uh, 
uh, young male and uh, not very spotted uh, adult female, and they look very similar. So it's not completely easy. Definitely. I know. Well, you wrote a whole booklet on how to yeah. snowy owls, didn't you? Yeah. So, and, and, and even I can be bewildered because I, I do have a, an image of a snowy owl on, as a back screen on my computer. And when I first, I took these in Saskatchewan, and then when I first started taking them up in Photoshop, I thought that this was a young male. And then I started watching the feathers that, no, it isn't a male. It is an adult female. So even I can get confused. <laughs> so it isn't easy. Um, could you describe how you catch an owl to put a transmitter on it? We usually, at the nest place, we usually catch them at the nest. And there we have used bow nets, which are uh, uh, remotely uh, triggered. We have to go half to one kilometer away from the nest and wait until the female stays on the nest and maybe also the male. So we usually try to capture both, both the male and the female. In Canada, in winter, uh, they are usually captured with a, maybe a, a, a hamster in a, um, a small cage. And then they have uh, either some, some nooses, which the owl get caught in, or they use a bow net, or they can use a, 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 a um, a net called the Dugasa, which is actually a loose net standing up that falls down if the owl hits it. So there are many, many different ways. And there is an old description from North America, a guy that dressed up as a haystack. There was a snowy owl sitting on a fence and he had a long pole with a noose on it. And as a haystack, he slowly approached the owl and he was able to capture it. <laughs> so ingenious ways. Okay, a couple people asked, um, you mentioned a biologist who provided a lot of insights on snowy owl behavior and psychology. Um, yes, Paul McDonald. Okay, and what yeah. was the most interesting revelation you discovered about their behavior from today? That was when he described how he could pretend to be a competing predator, uh, moving towards the lure that the owl was interested in, and he watched the behavior of the owl and he can really trigger an owl to attack the trap that he had set up for them and it was so nice he, he, he really gave us so much new insight about this knowledge it was it's just an experience to see people like that and be together with them um, what is the weight and size difference between male and female adults uh, I think Females usually weigh around two kilograms, maybe a little more, maybe up to 2.4. Sometimes this, now I'm at very approximate. And males, maybe down to 1.5 kilograms. So it's not that big difference, but a little bit. This is really roughly. Okay. Um, this is um, somebody dealing with captive snowy owls. They've had flat flies, the hippobosid flies, transmitting avian malaria. Um, oh. Captive snowy owls. Do wild snowy owls have flat flies living in their feathers also? Uh, you know, flat flies is one they're called. The, the, yeah, yeah, the ones that run sideways. Yeah, the hippobosid. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think you can find them on snowy owls. I, I don't remember having seen them, but uh, they are on many birds, so maybe they could be also on snowy owls, but I'm not sure about this. I think I've seen them on a dead one that we have in the free. Okay, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, oh, here's a question that came over from YouTube. How does um, daylight affect the behavior of snowy owls? Snowy owls definitely have to be active during daytime because they nest north of the polar cir circle. And then there you have 24 hours of daylight. But they, uh, even if you have uh, midnight sun, they m are most actively hunting at the night time of the day. And that is maybe because the wolves, the lemmings are most active during that time of the day. 
uh, and uh, when they come further south uh, and you have a you have a night and day they are very often crepuscular when they hunt birds and of course they may also stay up in the arctic above the polar circle during winter and then they have to really hunt when it is night time dusk or really dark so they are really flexible okay why would a snowy owl migrate if their destination has about the same climate as where they left from climate isn't the the, the question it is the amount of food available if there's no food you have to leave well, most most birds do not migrate because of climate. They migrate because of food availability. We see that in southern Norway. We have a lot of birds trying to, to uh, winter at the southernmost part of the country. Some of the population migrate to Denmark or England, but some stay here. And if there is no snow, they survive well. And if there is a lot of snow, they may have troubles. But if these are birds coming, coming to uh, bird feeders, then they survive. Okay, uh, how long does it take for a male to become completely white? I think it takes about four to five years. This is approximately, because we don't have that kind of information so detailed, but studying the, the how they lose black spots in the in the body feathers as the wings age. That is what I, I uh, suspect that after four to five years, they may be completely white. Okay. Uh, what is the longest single day migration movement that you've gotten from a GPS, from a transmitter? That I haven't uh, pinned down, so I can't tell. But we, we would have the data, but I haven't picked it out. So I'm not able to, to answer that. I have seen on, on the great gray owls that have moved up to uh, at least uh, 30 kilometers in a day. That's, uh, or is it, no, it's more like 150 kilometers a day. It's no problem at all. Of course, these are really fast flyers and snowy owls can fly high in the air and really take off. So they can move long distances. I've been three summers on the Bear Island between Norway and Spitsbergen. In summer, that is, no ice around, and suddenly a snowy owl can appear out from the blue, flying and landing on the island. And they may have come all the way from the Russian coast. So they have gone far, far away. Wow. Okay. How do males contribute to the care of the eggs and young owl and owlets? No owls, as far as I know, do any uh, incubation or, uh, or chick. Uh, attendance, they only provide the food. So if the female dies, then the male will just drop the food along the nest and he won't feed the chicks if they are too small. Then the chicks may starve in a heap of dead lemmings. But if the chicks are large enough, then uh, they can eat by themselves, then they will survive. If the male disappears, that is detrimental for the female. We've seen that a couple of times when the males really had trouble getting uh, enough food and started hunting small waders and they were not able to provide food for the females and then in the middle of the night females with really small chicks had to go out on, for, on themselves starting hunting and when they come came back uh, the chicks had, had frozen to death so that's also detrimental so they really have to cooperate how do you track vole populations Snap trapping is the standard method all over the world. Usually you put up a line with small traps and you capture a lot of the animals. And then you see how many animals do you capture in so and so many trap days. There may be other uh, surveillance methods now that doesn't uh, uh, depend on killing the animals. But I think this snap trapping is the most often used method. Uh, do snowy owls show increasing darker spots with less snow or warming weather? No, they tend to get lighter with age. And they also really get lighter through the year. 
when they have molted and got their new uh, plumage in uh, late uh, summer, they may have a lot of dark, nice spots. And they keep these dark black spots all through winter until you come into February, March. If they then still uh, are on, on the snow covered ground, the sun starts getting really powerful and you get an albedo from the light reflected from the ice. And then the feathers and the spots are really um, uh, starting to fade. So they are fading and getting almost white. A bird with a lot of black spots in summer can appear almost as, as a spotless in late uh, spring next year. Wow. Um, how much does one transmitter cost to put on, on the owl? And what are the ongoing costs associated with the transmitter? Uh, that's not my field actually, but they are quite expensive. I think they are um how much is this in dollar is it uh, two thousand dollars or something for a transmitter and then there's cost of getting the data so but but uh, that's I, i'm not the one that deals with that uh, information so i'm i can't uh, answer exactly um and a couple people have asked what makes an ideal nesting site that is more interesting that we have really looked into because it's Usually, usually the the nest is on an elevated mound because that is where the snow is usually blown off, so it is snow free when they start laying eggs. But it looks to us that at least in the Norwegian uh, nesting grounds, the the nest uh, mound is usually a bit lower than the terrain, at least in a in a semicircle around. It seems like the male wants to be able, when he is sitting hunting, uh, scouting for voles, he likes to be able to see down onto the nest. Then he can control if there are predators around. He can al also control the female so she doesn't make any sneak matings with other males. It may also be that the female wants to see the male when he is hunting, because when the male has got something when he catches a lemming, may, it may be one kilometer away, she immediately sees it and she, she goes like this <coughs> and she starts begging. So she really indicates that lemming is for me, come to me with it. <laughs> so it may be a, a question of each sex controlling the other one. But it is really, it's rare in our areas that it's really in flat terrain. It's more like a mound with more hilltops around for the male to hunt from. Okay. Um, is there anything known about how snowy owls naturally deal with black flies on their own? Do they do dust bathing or other methods? We don't know. We don't have the data. We couldn't tell. They may not be uh, exposed to them usually. <clears throat> Um, and a few people asked if you know if Hedwig is still alive. Uh, we wouldn't think so because she got the transmitter in 2011. That's nine years ago. But you never know. Suddenly she might appear. So that would be very exciting. We, we did expect to get uh, a vol, a lemming year last year in 2019. That was four years after 2015. And there seemed to be a lot of lemmings. But then in mid-February, there was a heavy rainfall in the northernmost part of Norway, which made uh, an ice crust between the snow and the ground. And the lemmings really crashed. So we didn't get any snowy owl nesting. So now we don't know when we will get the next chance. Um, are you okay with just keeping going with questions? Or do, we've been going for an hour and a half. Okay with me, you decide, you are the leader here. Well, I always like talking about owls and we still have people <laughs> around. So as long as you're willing to keep answering questions. Uh, this is a fun one. How did you first get interested in studying owls? I was lucky to get interested in birds in an area in Southeastern Norway where we had a 
guy who was a forester and he made the most wonderful nest boxes for owls from natural logs, hollowed logs. And he was kindly to, to, to share and deal out or pass out these uh, uh, wooden logs to all the young boys. And we started making our own nest boxes, putting out nest boxes and what maybe we get a boreal owl or something. And it was so exciting. And that was really the start of it. And then, but also in when I'm, I, I think I was 11 years old and one one day when I was sitting in the classroom, I was sitting along the, the window side. Suddenly there was a pygmy owl sitting in the birch tree just a meter away from me. And I was lost for that, for that uh, school hour. I was just watching this pygmy owl. And, I, and since then I've been lost to owls. So those two things were really important. Okay. Um, somebody was wondering if there are snowy owl tours in Norway. No, there are not. We are really, because our snowy owls do not appear during winter as in, in uh, Canada or US where you could actually go and watch them. When we have snowy owls, we usually get them during the nesting time. And we are really uh, silent and, and quiet and not talking too much about that because if you get a lot of photographers, there are sadly, too many wildlife photographers who really, I, I understand them, they would like to have photos of snowy owls. But if you get a rush for 10, 20, 10, 15, 20 photographers wanting to put up uh, camouflage tents, hides around the snowy owl nest, that wouldn't be very good for the snowy owl. So that's why we have to really be a bit uh, careful about that. So we can't have that. There are two related questions. So one is, was Hedwig sedated when you were handling her because she seemed no. ill? And then the other is, how are they when you're handling them to put transmitters on them? Do they try and bite or are they docile? Or? That depends, that is individually different. Some birds are really docile, but you have to, uh, you have to hold them so you don't give them an opportunity to start flapping about. The, the main thing is you hold the feet. The feet are the most dangerous part. And then you usually hold around the wings and the shoulders so the owl doesn't get the opportunity to start flapping because that, that would stress the bird up. So if you just keep it quiet, they stay quiet usually. But the, of course, some of them can, you can really take your almost uh, like an owl, start to preen them on the head with your nose and they like it. When other ones go, ah, they try to snap you. So you have to be careful. They are individuals. But you never sedate birds. You really treat them carefully and very slowly and try to be calm. That is the description of how you do it. And was Hedwig one of, was she just sedate because she was in terrible condition? Or? Well, when, when I treated her with, when I heated her up, of course, then she was almost frozen to death. So, but when we took her out to put the transmitter on her, then she was eager to. So if we had been careful, she would have got her claws into us or given me a bite. So she was ready to go. It's good when they're feisty like that. Yeah. Good for the owl, not necessarily for the people handling. No, that, that, it's a good sign. If the owl is really feisty, then it is in a good shape. And that is good. <clears throat> Um, have snowy owls been seen in Japan or China? I don't know. Probably in China, I would guess so. But Japan, I'm not sure. Like Hokkaido uh, in the north? Yeah, I've never been to Japan. So I, I wouldn't know, sadly. That was an interesting question. <laughs> um, what is included in the genetic research exactly that you've been doing or that somebody That's was doing? Uh, I don't know what they mean by included. They try to take uh, uh, tissue, uh, bits of tissue, and they extract DNA and compare it. But I'm I'm not a DNA biologist, so I, I can't I can't explain a lot about this. I'm I'm really a, 
a dummy in this area. <laughs> so did they do some work like to see relatedness of owls or it's just other genetic things like how diverse they are, genetically diverse? That was, that was how, how, how diverse they were and if they were uh, uh, separated in subgroups. Now we are really, we do have more, uh, more DNA samples uh, recently. And now we are really trying to, to link up to see if they are related. And for instance, when we collect molt feathers on the nest and we have a DNA from the birds that nested in uh, Norway, for instance, four years or eight years ago, we can use the DNA from the feathers to see if we have a new bird, if it is the same bird appearing. We did have some some uh, um, re uh, uh, reports, three or four females, which we had in 2015, that were owls that nested in 2011, without us having being able to capture them. So it is really a nice method, and it's a non-invasive method. If you pick molt feathers at a nest. You can get a lot of information, not capturing the owls, not pestering the owls, and even you, you can get the samples. So that's a, it's a really nice way of studying wildlife. Are there any special behaviors that snowy owls have that other owls do not have? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. They are really buboes. They were, they were, they were linked together with the other bubos, the eagle owl and the great horned owl of North America. Probably is the, the, the great horned owl in North America is its closest relative. And I've seen from the wing feathers, there is one um, fact that really links them with the eagle owls. And that is that they have 15 secondaries. All the bubos have 15 secondaries, while most of the other owls have 10 or 11. Even the the long eared owls and the whole, um, long uh, and the short eared owls, which have long wings, have only eleven secondaries. They have long primaries, but they don't have fifteen secondaries. That's very interesting. And uh, also, snowy owls have huge eyes. I, I as a, as a as a museum uh, curator, I deal a lot with dead birds, and I know that. Eagle owls, they have really huge eyes in the in the cranium and the snowy owls have the same. Their eyes are huge. So they have really good eyesight. While another bird like the great gray owl has just small eyes. They rely on the hearing, but the snowies, they are sight hunters. Oh, so now I have to ask you to tell everybody this one because I think it's amazing. Talk a little bit about um, how you studied how far a snowy owl can see its prey. Well, that, that was something I did in, back in 1993, before it became even possible to put transmitters on snowy owls, because back then the transmitters were too huge. But we knew that the development would sometime in the future make it possible to put transmitters on owls. So, and that summer in 93, we did have an influx of snowy owls in Northern Norway. So I went up there to, try to test if it was possible to use the um, Robert Nero method of a fake vole on the line to pull the snowy owls in. So I had a fake vole on a line that I threw out and watched the snowy owls sitting far away with a telescope. And I saw when they were looking in my direction, I pulled the vole. And then I saw the reaction of the owls. And I definitely had an owl that spotted the vole on more than one kilometer's distance and the vole wasn't bigger than this. So they can really see voles and lemmings for more than one kilometer. I know the guys in Saskatchewan, I think they have seen snowy owls reacting for small prey on of up to two kilometers distance. So they have a fantastic eyesight. Fantastic. Hmm. Um, the question is, do they have unusually long wingspans? And you kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, I think they have quite long wings because they are long distance flyers. And also they are excellent bird hunters. They hunt on the wing. And that, the, it was a snowy owl that re revealed that to me, but I've seen it uh, later in the, when I've seen great horned owls on the wing and even eagle owls on the wing. They are excellent flyers 
and they are excellent bird hunters and they hunt birds on the wing. We had a snowy owl in, in Saskatchewan in 2010 that took off up into the, into the air after a pigeon and it flew after the pigeon up in the air. And when it reached the pigeon, it turned on its back and grabbed the pigeon from beneath and went down and ate pigeon. That is something. Wow. Uh, what factors contributed to their current endangered status? The question is why, <clears throat> why have they declined, for instance, here in Scandinavia? We do not know, but I suspect that there are too few birds around for them to hunt. We do still have vole years, but <clears throat> when snowy owls appear, if they, if they come to the breeding grounds, they may appear during midwinter or in February, March, April. And at that time, there are no lemmings on top of the snow. They only start to appear when the snow starts melting and you get melt, free melted patches. Then the voles turn up. So in that first period, they have to hunt birds. And in the mountain tundra areas we have, it's only uh, grouse and ptarmigan that are the potential prey. And I suspect that there are too few of these birds around. I think I, that's my, my uh, uh, belief. I think that is the main reason we don't have them anymore in the southern part of Norway. And we have a couple related molt ones. So one question is, do the feathers molt the same patterns each cycle? Do they have unique feathers? And the other is, what ex explanations do you have for the unique molting process of snowies? And don't most bird species molt most of their flight feathers every year? Uh, most large birds do not molt all their flight feathers each year. And especially raptors and owls, they it takes up to 45 to 50 days for a molted feather to grow back. And they can't molt all the primaries in the wing at the same time because then they wouldn't be able to fly. They have to be able to fly to hunt. So they, it isn't time for an owl, a large owl to molt all the wing feathers in a year. So they have to space it out through several years. And the molt pattern that I see in the wings of snowy owls is very similar to the pattern I see in eagle owls. Actually, I used the pattern on the European eagle owl when I first made the interpretation of the patterns I saw on the snowy owl, because we didn't have any snowy owls with no names. That was the problem. Uh, um, and then the amount of feathers an owl molt is linked to its um, nutr nutritional status. If there is a huge amount of prey available, the owl may molt more feathers than if it is in a bad state. So that also depends. Uh, it it, it um, uh, decides how many feathers an owl will molt. One uh, owl may molt just a few feathers one year and the next year, several more. Um, I do know that a feather that is molted and replaced with a new one, the new one does not necessarily have the same bar pattern because I do have wing photos of owls showing that. But the, the question is, is the variation within these feathers less than the variation between one between two di different individuals? And that I do not know. Okay, are snowy owls victims of illegal killing and poisoning? Mm. Not anymore, I think. That's very rare. Of course, there may be uh, a rare owl being killed uh, uh, on purpose, but I think that's so rare that that isn't the main threat. It could be, but I don't, at least in our part of the world, I don't think that is any, any uh, important threat. Uh, there was there were a lot of, of snowy owls uh, killed as bycatch when in the old uh, uh, Soviet people used to capture polar foxes with uh, falling traps, with, with stones falling over the animal. Then some snowy owls went to the bait in winter and were killed. And we know from all the times when there were a lot of, uh, of noose catching of, uh, of uh, ptarmigan, sometimes snowy owls 
got caught in these traps as well. But that too is a rare event, I think. Can a male supply food from more than one female at a time? Yes, they can. There are incidents of, of uh, polygamous males with two females. Not often, but there are incidents. It is, this, it is well known in snowy owls. And it is what you can expect when prey is suddenly very numerous. Um, oh, where did that one just go here? It moved. Um, how long does it take snowy owl fledglings to become fully independent? Well, in Norway, they, <clears throat> they usually hatch um, in the end of June and start uh, wandering about uh, from the nest in mid-July, maybe late July. I think uh, this is thing I don't have strict data on it. I think they will rely on the adults up until maybe uh, mid-September, October, before they are fully able to hunt by themselves. It's a gradual process. The young birds have to learn how to hunt, but they are still begging from the adults as long as possible. And that may also be individually uh, different. Some adults are willing to feed their ticks for a longer time than some other individuals. Why was their um, genus name changed from Nyctia to Bubo? I do not uh, know that specifically, but I agree with the change because to me it is really a polar eagle owl, the polar bubo. There are so many um, anatomical similarities between the snowy owl and the eagle owl that I really see that this is a bubo. Even the sound, the, the snowy owl goes whoo, and the eagle owl goes whoo, whoo, it's just a drop at the end. But that's that's more like a um, incidental but but the the the, the an anatomy of the bird is really similar do they ever catch fish in the water i don't know if they catch in the water but i i i picked apart a pellet that i collected in barrow in 2005 and there were fish bones and fish jaws in it but if it had eaten an, a fish that it found on land or actually captured it i can't tell but I wouldn't expect them to do that. How common are snowy owls in the US and are they most commonly seen in the winter? They are most commonly seen in the winter. And in US, it's only in Alaska where you can find them breeding. Most of them around Barrow. And Denver Holt is really the guy to ask about all about snowy owls in North America. <laughs> he knows everything. <laughs> How many snowy owls live in Norway? Well, the last two nesting seasons in 2011 and 2015, we did find around uh, between uh, the, the ones we found and the reports we got indicated that there were some somewhere about 50 nesting pairs in, in 2011. Most of them were in Norway. But in 2015, they were uh, uh, likely partitioned between Sweden and Norway. There were more breeding than in Sweden. So maybe there in the good year could be some place between 50 and 80 pairs of snowy owls. But we know uh, in 1978, we had a huge uh, congregation of snowy owls in northern Sweden when they, they also nested in Norway that year, but there were nobody actively studying them. But in Sweden, they, they uh, have uh, said that maybe they had up to 200 nesting pairs of snowy owl. That was the last really big year here in Scandinavia. Um, how do snowy owls react to human contact? Uh, they're quite shy. Uh, usually, if you walk in the terrain, they, they tend to fly away if you are a couple of hundred meters away from them. But it's almost like the same we see in, uh, in Canada and Saskatchewan as well. 
they usually don't come close up to humans. It's it's if they do, it would be first year juveniles, maybe maybe in um, emaciated state. That could be the case, but usually they're quite shy. Um, how do you find the perception of people towards owls, positive or negative, in Norway and places you have visited? Well, in Norway, it's it's uh, usually just positive. I don't I don't find anybody negative to owls. They and used I they used to be in in back before they were protected. If you go 30, 40 years back, there were some people that actually killed eagle owls, but that has stopped. So. I don't think you find anybody who are actually negative to owls. And are there any fairy tales or traditions about snowy owls in Norway? No, no. I think you have to go to the Inuits to get that. Okay. Um, I think most of the questions you've touched on mm -hmm. answered to some degree. Um, okay. And we're almost at two hours now. Yeah. That's long. Um, is there anything else you want to say to wrap up? No. Should we, we could for, are you okay with people contacting you via email directly if they have additional questions? Well, then they must be prepared that it may be impossible for me to answer, but hey, it is possible to do it, yes. Okay, so we if may- they have, If they have serious questions. Okay, all right. Um, and just a couple things on our end. Um, we will be saving this video on YouTube. Ruar has given us permission to do that. So this will be able to be watched later if people weren't able to stay for the whole time or if they were part of the group that I goofed up their registration for and couldn't get in here or if people just wanna watch it later. And next week um, on Sunday, we're having David Johnson, the director of the Global Owl Project talking about owls in myth and culture. Um, it'll be the same time. Hopefully I'll have technology worked out a little bit better before then. Um, and we just thank Ruar very much for doing this. I'll give you, I promise to give you lots of coffee when you come in visit next time. Well, thank you all for watching. It's a yes. pleasure. And thank you all for donating to help make this happen too, so that we can kind of keep going at the Owl Center and we hope to continue sharing throughout the North America or the Northern Hemisphere winter. I know some of you are in the Southern Hemisphere, but uh, we're kind of hoping we can go to February or maybe March with the series, hopefully once a week. So thanks for tuning in and hope to see you again. Thank you much.